Good morning, everybody. Just watching the participants list increase. And as always, I'd like to say just killing time uh, to uh, allow people to join us this morning. Good morning. I hope you're having a good uh, last, uh, I think it's last Wednesday of April uh, and having a great week um, and enjoying the, the better weather. We have a really a, a important a medical grand rounds uh, presenter today talking about an important topic that's um, important to us about generic drugs. Um, and uh, before that, we just have some brief updates. Again, as I mentioned, um, we don't have too many updates these days and compared to the years prior, thanks to things doing better. But if there is anything you'd like to see us updated at, at Grand Rounds, um, please do let me know. We do have one update. I'll turn it to Dr. Salas. Dr. Salas, thanks for being here and providing um, updates as well. Thanks so much. Uh, it's lovely to be here as always. Uh, just one quick announcement from our group, which is this upcoming conversation uh, following up on or as the next installment in our series on the 1619 project. Uh, so for those folks who don't know, we've been kind of marching through the podcast and having discussions all together about kind of the implications and, and um, especially for us at Stanford and in healthcare specifically. So this uh, next installment will be on May 8th. So not next Monday, but the Monday after uh, discussing the fifth episode of the podcast, uh, which is called The Land of Our Fathers Part One. And you can scan this QR code um, either for the podcast episode or the one on the right for the uh, registration for the event. I'll also put the link for the registration into the chat. The podcasts are usually relatively short, between 30 and 40 minutes. Um, so we try to make it you know, pretty easy for folks to be able to listen to when you're walking or driving. So hope people can join us. And that, that's it. I'll put the link in the chat. Thanks so much, Dr. Rosalia. Uh, thank you, Dr. Charles, as well, again, for always providing uh, these important updates. Um, and then, again, we really don't have too many other updates. The main thing, as was mentioned, is next week, we do have an in-person medical grand rounds. Our grand round speaker is Dr. Sergio Aguilar uh, Gaxiola. He'll be talking about the topic advancing health, mental health equity with historically underserved populations via community-engaged approaches. So, um, uh, he's a presenter that a lot of our faculty have been looking forward to coming see. So please do join us in person if you can. Otherwise, we'd love to have you online as always. So looking forward to next week's presentation. That being said, I want to now pass it over to Dr. Kevin Schulman. He's our uh, Associate Chair of Business Development, among many other roles he plays in our department and the community at large. He was actually instrumental in inviting our presenter today, David Light, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Valley Shore. Dr. Um, Schulman's support in medical grand rounds oftentimes leads to some of the most important topics. Today's a great example of that. So Dr. Shulman, thank you for helping set this up today. He's got to actually, Dr. Shulman has to run to present at the White House in 30 minutes on this exact topic. Today you'll hear about, um, so I'll, I'll field questions after, but Dr. Shulman, thank you for being here, helping set things up and introducing uh, David Light. Turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zago. So uh, it's you know, as we think about uh, one of the most common activities we do as physicians is write a prescription. Uh, these days, about 90% of the prescriptions we write are for generic drugs. And if there's something you've noticed uh, about these medicines is they come from all over the world. Um, they have manufacturers that we've never seen before. Um, our patients get different color pills every month from uh, all kinds of different supply chains. Um, and at the end of the day, the question is, you know, are, are these things, uh, how are these things made? Where are these made? Who's watching uh, this whole enterprise? Uh, for the last couple of years, we've been looking at this question. It's really been fascinating and really fortunate to have David Light here to kind of walk through his journey looking at the quality of uh, drugs in the United States. Uh, David's the chief executive officer of Alisher, uh, which is an independent testing lab in Connecticut. Uh, he's a biotech entrepreneur and scientist, uh, a graduate of Yale University, uh, where he studied molecular biology and then worked at startups, uh, including synthetic genomics, ion torrent, and now uh, starting Valisher. He'll talk a little bit about the origin story uh, and, uh, and his findings and his work. Uh, so David, thank you so much. I also want to just a brief uh, reach out some of the, what David's going to talk about. We, David and I, have been for, I've been fortunate to collaborate with David on some of this work, uh, but also Ben Teasdale, who's a Stanford uh, Med Scholar, uh, has been uh, working on this as well. So, David, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me and, and that uh, great introduction and good luck at the White House on this this critical topic. Um, 
I guess it's a good excuse for for not seeing the whole presentation, but I think you know a lot about it. Um, so I will share my screen now, hopefully. I'm able to see my screen. Looks great. Perfect. Um, so yeah, as uh, uh, Kevin very nicely laid out, i uh, going to talk today about drug quality and safety issues in the United States, kind of as a whole, but also strategies that are really forming now. And, and I know uh, White House and others very interested in how to address these. Uh, and the conversation has really become nationally, not so much, is there a problem, but what are we doing about the problem? And of course, uh, how deep does the problem go? Um, so I'll, I'll introduce a little bit about the origin story of Valisher, at the very least, and, and my personal experience in this. Um, try to delve a little bit into why these problems exist or some of the core problems themselves. And then let's look at the data. So um, we have a lot of data, you know, anecdotal to uh, actual chemical testing. There's a lot of studies out there. I'll highlight some of them um, and then spend some time on how do we potentially uh, fix or at the very least do a much better job uh, on addressing these issues. Uh, and there's a few uh, options there, uh, some of which are actually happening in, in the United States currently, um, and also try and address some of the concerns as we do more on quality and what happens to cost and access. So uh, we'll get into hopefully all of these and, and happy to take questions at the end. So to start off, um, myself and a good friend of mine from my time at Yale, uh, Adam Clark Joseph, um, really um, had this whole voucher concept, an independent uh, testing concept, start off with issues that Adam himself was experiencing. So he's been on anticonvulsant medications for many years, obviously a very important neurotherapeutic index drugs. And uh, he realized that every once in a while, he'd refill his medications and at the refill, then he would feel differently, get side effects, relapses sometimes, talk to his doctors, and his doctors would tell him, listen, there's just nothing much we can do about it. It, it is, is what it is. So he obviously didn't like that answer. And the whole concept, very high level of what we decided to do with Valisher and with independent testing is to actually test and certify drug products. Um, and this is a very accepted approach in almost any other consumer uh, product that, that, that's out there, whether um, a regulated product um, or not, um, and whether industry-driven or consumer-driven. Um, you can't buy a lamp or a power cord in the United States without having it be independently tested by UL or other independent laboratories that are, are putting all sorts of badges of quality. Uh, on those products. And of course, we're all very familiar with food, you know, cars, highly regulated product, uh, IIHS safety ratings uh, were done independently decades ago. Um, so a lot of forces to improve the trust and the overall quality metrics of products that we interact with every day, but entirely absent, at least before Valisher was started, from the pharmaceutical industry. And if that's one of our big focuses, you know, why do we have that focus in the first place? What are some of the root causes of these issues? And especially with the generic drug industry as a whole, for the last 40 years, it's been extremely important for cost savings, as Dr. Schulman outlined, um, but is also a vast global market where the entire focus has just been cost. Quality um, is assumed by an FDA approval, and we'll talk more about that, um, but there's really no transparency to the product quality itself. Um, quality issues themselves have only become more and more apparent over time. Um, data from the FDA here showing that drug shortages, the vast majority of reasons for drug shortages um, are due to quality issues. Um, and you know, the, the next most common is unknown, which is largely uh, most likely quality issues as well. So this is a very serious issue that, that affects uh, the healthcare systems in, in many ways. Um, and obviously we need more options to at least have transparency and also reward quality and not just assume that everything is identical and commoditized. Um, the supply chain itself, 
is incredibly complex. I think there's sometimes that uh, assumption uh, that you, there's a product that gets made uh, from the factory, goes to the pharmacy, and then goes to the patient. Um, even this schematic is, is a vast simplification. And so point is that problems can crop up all throughout the supply chain. You know, not just the final dosage forms, the active pharmaceutical ingredients, the raw materials, and, and it is a very, very global supply chain. I think another important, um, often misconception or misunderstanding um, of, of how this system is, is overseen today. So if there's a lot of reason for concerns kind of inherently at a 10,000 foot level, well, surely the FDA is testing everything and, and the Food and Drug Administration um, is, is ensuring the quality of all of our medicines. And that's absolutely the, the job of the FDA is to help ensure the efficacy and safety of drugs. But um, I think there's a, a lot of limitations to what's able to be done in, in, in one agency and sole reliance is, um, is certainly allowing for a lot of cracks in the system. And I think there's also a lot of uh, misconceptions of the system. So a lot of people, when they think of the FDA and drug approvals and, and drug oversight, you're thinking of a new drug, cost billions of dollars often to create a new drug. It's an incredibly long and, and involved process with large clinical trials. Um, and uh, that's, that's all true, but that's the new drug application. Um, a generic drug approval is extremely abbreviated from that, um, actually allowing uh, a, a bioequivalence of up to uh, between minus 20 to plus 25 percent is what this small clinical trial has to show uh, in comparison to the brand. Um, so it's abbreviated. Um, and even all of this initial approval is not the same thing as quality and safety monitoring. The actual manufacturing batch per batch that the manufacturers are, are making is really an honor system where the manufacturers are self-reporting that data, whether they're in the United States, India, China, Europe, uh, and obviously the vast majority of manufacturing for drug products is concentrated in India and China, which is uh, a concern on many levels, uh, including national security. But point is that this data is not being generated by the FDA. This is self-reported honor system data. And what the FDA is responsible to do is go in and inspect the facilities themselves, inspect the paperwork. And even that is limited in many ways. Uh, overseas inspections often have two months of heads up before the agents actually show up in the facility. Um, and that's when they're even able to get to the facility. COVID has obviously added new layers of complications. And now the majority of even the high-risk facilities overseas have not been inspected in over five years. So uh, certainly a lot of cause for concern that the current system uh, could be augmented and uh, perhaps really should be. So one of the things that Adam and I started looking at right away is you know, the experience that Adam has um, is certainly not unique to Adam. And, and we did a lot of market research early on to understand from patients um, from a variety of different uh, 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 treatment regimens um, have often seen this same thing. And we hear it a lot from practitioners too, where there'll be a patient complaint about uh, drug products and not just side effects, of course, that's expected. But the important part of the question is at a refill. At a refill, whenever a, a patient goes to the pharmacy to get a refill, it's almost always a new batch of medication and sometimes even a new manufacturer as the purchasers are constantly changing over manufacturers uh, to chase the lowest price. Um, and when that price is the only metric, um, we're often unfortunately ignoring quality. And this issue of at a refill, the patient uh, perceiving uh, a problem with the treatment, the effectiveness of the treatment is actually quite common and, and happens uh, quite often to the folks that are noticing it. And not just patients, but also uh, doctors and practitioners. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. Shulman uh, outlined, you know, this is an area that uh, he's focused on, having seen it with his own children um, with certain drug products. Um, uh, uh, facilities like the Cleveland Clinic have been uh, having multiple doctors very engaged on this uh, for some time. 
Um, Catherine Eben's book, Bottle of Lies, uh, goes into depth on some of these doctors' experiences. Uh, pharmacologists like Joe Graydon that have uh, seen many reports uh, from patients and even followed up and, and had uh, issues that have been identified that have, that have led to uh, national recalls. So it's, it's more and more common to be hearing not just from patients, but also from doctors about these kinds of issues. And so for Adam and I, at the very least, what we decided to do is we're going to check. Uh, we're going to simply take an independent look, a chemical analysis of samples from batches of, of medications and look, looking every single batch. Um, and we'll talk more about the, the dynamics of that, but this first iteration of this concept um, started with our own pharmacy. So we were buying, you know, let's say 10,000 tablets at a time from the standard distributors, taking a few tablets out of that batch, analyzing it for a variety of different important metrics, um, and then assuming everything passed, we would be dispensing it to patients around the United States with a certificate of analysis, very much like nutritional information on food. <clears throat> and importantly, there's, there's a number of tests that, that often get run, um, depending on the product, uh, but um, certainly very important to look at things like the potency, the dosage, um, uh, one of the most common questions, but also the uh, impurities, and that's had a lot of impact, and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that. It's also very straightforward um, to understand what the potential impacts are of uh, specific levels of impurities. Um, and then also disillusion. How does the, the tablet or, or capsule actually come apart um, and release within the body? Um, at least from uh, an in vitro standpoint, we can test for that. And so these are kind of the core tests. We're constantly adding more, but these are a core analytics that uh, are really important and can change even from batch to batch and certainly from manufacturer to manufacturer. So to start off on the contaminant side, um, and, and this is uh, a big summary and won't go into every little detail here, of course, but just to underscore that in about two years of testing, so I'd, I'd say a relatively short period of time, we've been quite prolific in finding quite a number of, of major issues um, with a variety of different contaminants, uh, largely concentrated um, in the carcinogen, the, the probable human carcinogen and DMA, and the known human carcinogen benzene. Um, so we'll talk more about those in depth. But just to underscore here that <clears throat> although the FDA does not routinely test um, drug products, uh, it does have a four cause testing program. They do a few dozen tests a year um, and pick certain drug products that they're going to analyze. And ironically enough, a lot of these products and, and the major recalls that we've seen over the last few years were actually identified to be part of these four cause tests, um, but they'd all passed in, in the FDA analyses. And it was really independent testing with, with Valsher or in the case of Valsartan, you know, Novartis identified the original NDMA contamination uh, that have brought these, these issues to light and, and certainly had pretty dramatic impact um, which, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, you've probably read uh, in one capacity or another about a variety of high impact recalls that have happened. Um, you know, Zantac, ranitidine products, metformin, a top diabetes drug, but we'll talk a lot more about those two specifically. Um, also uh, the benzene contaminations that we've seen in a variety of extremely high volume uh, consumer products um, has certainly captured a lot of news but also a significant industry impact. <clears throat> There's been uh, recalls of, of millions of, of drug products um, that have affected many billions of dollars of sales and, and also um, billions of dollars of potential litigation uh, concerns as well. So the, the industry <clears throat> has, has definitely been affected um, in a variety of different ways and, and the impact really going pretty deep from, from a variety of these discoveries. So to get into uh, a little bit deeper on, on some of these specific contaminants. Um, so benzene um, has been extremely well studied uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, we added it to our own uh, screening and, and testing program um, at Valisher in, in late 2020. And <clears throat> excuse me. The, the background on it 
is that uh, it's been directly correlated to cancer and, and leukemia in, in humans, unfortunately, due to uh, high levels of exposure over many years from petroleum workers. Um, and the hemotoxicity of, of benzene has been known for, for many, many years, uh, over a century. And it's, <clears throat> it's, it's often used as an industrial solvent um, and, and been used to make pharmaceuticals um, and a variety of products um, in, in industry, um, usually early on in, in the 20th century. But uh, in, <clears throat> in the late uh, 1980s, um, or even 1970s, 1980s, there was a lot of studies that came out um, about the carcinogenic properties of benzene. And uh, since then, there's been many limits set on benzene. It's, it's well known um, as a, a contaminant and a carcinogen. Um, so uh, whether it's FDA or other limits, um, and really the FDA limit gets talked about a lot, but it's an emergency limit. Uh, important to, to realize that. Uh, that only in very specific situations does the two parts per million apply, like hand sanitizer being manufactured during the pandemic um, or other uh, specific emergency situations. So uh, to look into what we actually found um, from uh, the benzene uh, perspective, we, we looked at a variety of different consumer products um, like hand sanitizer, uh, sunscreens, body sprays, and we see that it's, it's very clear that not all products are affected. Um, this can uh, vary a lot, not just from manufacturer to manufacturer, but even from batch to batch within a manufacturer. Um, and uh, some portion of these batches that have very high levels of contamination of benzene, uh, well over two parts per million, and kind of everything in between in terms of uh, the amount of benzene that we're finding, and certain products uh, more than others. Um, products like body sprays and, and spray products in general, uh, we found a pretty high prevalence of, of benzene in those kinds of products. So looking here, uh, this is actually a study that we published in Environmental Health Perspectives, where we even got hundreds of products that got sent to us by um, individuals around the United States and Canada, uh, looking at sunscreen products and, and finding really correlations um, to um, uh, uh, specific raw materials. So sprays where propellants like propane and butane um, are used quite often um, have been found to be uh, certainly a potential sources of contamination. Uh, gel products um, where uh, raw materials like carbomers are used quite often um, also seem to have a pretty high propensity of uh, contamination. So pretty uh, straightforward from an overall contamination standpoint of, of these raw materials that are the beginning of the supply chain. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we'll continue to see a lot more information, I'm sure, about benzene as, as more information comes out. Uh, many factors have pointed to these um, uh, raw materials as well, uh, but even the initial data uh, certainly showing uh, this batch-to-batch -batch variability uh, being related to these raw materials and, and where they're coming from. But now, <clears throat> excuse me for a second. So um, <clears throat> NDMA uh, allows us to look at a, a different category of carcinogen, nitrosamines um, themselves have been um, an area of focus for, for many, many years. And uh, this is a probable human carcinogen, so there's never been a direct correlation of exposure to NDMA um, and cancer in humans, but it's very well studied in literature and in animal models. It's actually used to induce cancer um, in rats in clinical studies. Um, and <clears throat> this is going back you know, to the to the seventies, even there, there's Senate hearings about this, uh, specifically uh, dimethyl nitrosamine or NDMA um, has been known for a very long time to be a, a very potent carcinogen, and it's also been studied with analytical techniques for for many many years. So it's often talked about. Well, we have a lot of new technology these days, um, and we're finding more and more. But for some of these contaminants like NDMA, like benzene, 
the, the core technology has been around for many decades. I mean, all the way back to the 1970s, this was being analyzed at, at picogram levels, not just nanogram levels. So <clears throat> these are very serious contaminants to be taken, uh, certainly very seriously. Um, and uh, the, the study of them has been very robust for many years. So to look at some of these specific examples, um, NDMA and Valsartan. Valsartan was the first drug product to, to have broad recalls um, specifically on NDMA. And it actually wasn't present uh, in any molecular standpoint on the drug molecule itself uh, from Valsartan, but dimethylformamide, which is a solvent uh, that was used to make a Valsartan was identified as a likely root cause of where it was coming from. And it was really side reactions of the dimethylamine group um, in DMF. And you can see that obviously on, on NDMA. And when <clears throat> we started looking at this um, at Valisher, uh, we actually saw that DMF itself was also heavily present in a variety of products. And DMF is also a group 2A carcinogen, the solvent itself. Um, so uh, we were Certainly quite concerned about that, uh, filed our first FDA citizen petition about it, and you know, underscored that this was identified in 2018 as a group 2A carcinogen, and the FDA has still not updated its guidance on DMF that was last published in 2017. Um, this was also pretty interesting to note that we found this kind of contamination, not just in the generic drug products at various amounts, but even in the brand. Um, and Novartis uh, specifically commented that uh, they don't use DMF, uh, are aware of DMF, uh, but the possibility that the suppliers of their suppliers could have had some amount of DMF come in um, was very interesting and I think further underscores the immense complexity of the supply chain, uh, even with, if you're aware and looking for some of these products um, or, or trying to avoid them. Um, you know, this kind of independent testing can certainly identify it and, and find it um, um, when, uh, when they're a very difficult supply chain uh, to, to fully manage uh, around the world. So a very uh, different scenario to Valsartan was seen with ranitidine. So ranitidine, uh, Zantac, um, what we're looking at here again is the ranitidine molecule. And now, unlike Valsartan, you actually do see the dimethylamine <clears throat> um, group on the ranitidine molecule itself. Um, and interestingly, you also see uh, a nitrite group on uh, the ranitidine molecule, uh, which can very easily react into the nitroso on uh, nitroso dimethylamine. So really, both primary groups uh, being present there um, with ranitidine. And uh, we filed uh, a, a citizen petition about this as well. Um, our direct concern was really that these two pieces were combining to form NDMA, to, to put it crudely. Um, and days afterwards, uh, Canada uh, banned all ranitidine products. Uh, over 40 countries followed in the next few months and weeks. And um, by, uh, by April of, of the next year, the FDA did uh, request a recall of or withdrawal of all ranitidine products. And we'll talk more about that, but here just to kind of illustrate a very different source of this kind of, of uh, contamination and carcinogen problem. <clears throat> and then uh, metformin, uh, quite different uh, as well, somewhere in between uh, the ranitidine and valsartan examples, where you do see the, the dimethylamine of, of NDMA there, uh, but no nitrite or, or nitroso source. And what we found with the contamination that we identified in, in metformin is that, again, you actually saw a very batch-to-batch -batch type of situation, very similar to all the situations we just looked at with benzene, um, where depending on the manufacturer and depending on the batch, you know, some manufacturers all of the batches that we looked at uh, were failing, some manufacturers, all of them were passing and some in between, uh, where it really depended, uh, depended on the specific batch that was made, where we obviously don't have any information on, on how it was made or what the raw materials were that were used, but um, a very inconsistent and batch level problem uh, that we identified there with metformin. So a number of scientific ways that, that these problems can come up um, and to delve into 
the timeline and testing of some of these that have been talked about a lot, like uh, ranitidine. Um, ranitidine has actually been studied for decades in relation to NDMA. Uh, if you just look at the literature uh, that mentions ranitidine and, and NDMA um, since its approval in 1981 uh, in Europe and uh, 2018, there are over 400 peer-reviewed articles that have looked at this problem. Uh, just a selection of some that came out from the early 1980s, um, being very concerned about ranitidine and the formation of NDMA and these exact kind of drug and nitrite interactions that we're talking about today. Um, in that same FDA program of, of four cause analyses, uh, both ranitidine and azadidine, which has a very similar structural issue, um, were identified because of quality issues such as discoloration and impurities. But all those tests passed. And uh, really what, what we saw at uh, Valisher is that when we ran our standard NDMA analysis screen um, for all drug products, not just looking at the Sartans uh, where the problem started, uh, we found uh, huge detections, uh, millions of nanograms, which got us thinking that this is due to a, a fundamental instability, the, the actual um, uh, act of analyzing this product through the GCMS, which has some you know, usually relatively benign uh, heating uh, components of that analysis, was driving a reaction to actually form NDMA. And so we also developed a low temperature headspace analysis uh, system in the GC to, to try and have uh, a lower impact uh, during analysis. And we found no NDMA in the tablets through this process, but using World Health Organization standards for drug nitrite formation uh, that they developed in the 1970s, um, we saw that in these conditions, stomach relevant conditions with nitrite added, um, we again see a tremendous amount of formation of NDMA. So we informed the FDA of this, and a few months later, saw the press release on contamination uh, and, and an LCMS methodology that was developed. Um, and the FDA later commented that simulated gastric fluid was tested and no NDMA formation was, was seen. But again, nitrite being an incredibly important component of that. Um, and it's since been debated heavily about the levels of nitrite, but Surely nitrite uh, exists uh, heavily in the stomach and is an important component of, of doing this kind of analysis. And uh, we had um, a study that was supposed to come out in, in January of 2020, um, where we had a Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center that had some epidemiology, uh, various chemistry information, and it was uh, set to publish. And, and the day before, after it being peer reviewed, um, it was pulled due, due to needing a further review, um, which was very uh, frustrating to say the least. But a few months later, the FDA did finally uh, withdraw uh, the products, uh, all ranitidine products. And uh, about uh, almost a year later, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, the original developer of this drug, um, also did a root cause analysis uh, paper. And here's the figure. Um, looks quite similar and, and essentially confirming this reaction mechanism of uh, these two moieties on the molecule forming uh, NDMA. Um, and with variations in storage and, and uh, production, uh, certainly generating a lot of uh, NDMA in unacceptable levels. Um, a year later, we did publish um, uh, the, at least the chemistry side. Um, uh, JAMA did not want the epidemiology published. Uh, again, rather frustrating, but in the last few months even, uh, there have been a lot more epidemiology that's being done, a variety of different papers published, one of the largest uh, being shown here with, with over 55,000 people in Taiwan, a longitudinal cohort uh, study, and um, seeing uh, some pretty significant correlations to various cancers, especially liver, um, which in rats is, is where uh, the, the cancer is most common, and even a dose-dependent um, correlations, uh, depending on higher dosage and higher correlations uh, to the risk of cancer in human beings. So this is an active area of, of uh, analysis, but uh, certainly interesting to see the data continue to come out. And also an interesting background in the metformin testing. 
So before uh, all the recalls um, in 2015, uh, again, uh, four cause analyses at, at the FDA of, of metformin being a high risk uh, solid oral generic product. Um, they tested uh, actually about 20% of their 2015 tests. Uh, 13 tests um, were focused on metformin, a variety of different uh, manufacturers. It was tested again in 2016 um, and uh, all these tests passed. But in February of 2020, um, as there were many signals around the world of uh, potential contamination issues with, uh, with NDMA and metformin, um, the FDA analyzed specifically for metformin that they uh, requested products from manufacturers, um, so perhaps not a very independent sourcing. Um, again, they all passed. Uh, Canada had recalls in that month. Um, and then a month later, we analyzed products uh, uh, from uh, the that we were purchasing direct from uh, distributors and found that a significant portion contained NDMA uh, and DMF uh, carcinogens. Um, and we shared some of those products uh, with the FDA directly. And then a month later, uh, recalls ensued and uh, recalls have, have happened for the last couple of years uh, with metformin. And um, so uh, even to underscore that a lot of these uh, original manufacturers that have been identified in previous uh, analytics were um, uh, manufacturers that had recalls uh, in 2020 and, and beyond. So a lot about contaminants, and, and again, contaminants can be really impactful, but um, we look, uh, we try to look pretty holistically at, uh, at, dis at uh, the quality um, of products and dissolution is another area that has a lot of concern how a product actually comes apart. This is generally tested for by essentially putting uh, a tablet in a uh, container, about a one liter container of liquid and having a paddle that will spin around and, and the, the, as the tablet is dissolving, taking samples over time to evaluate uh, how much product, uh, how much active ingredient is being dissolved. And one of the uh, fascinating, I think kind of concerning elements is that each manufacturer, each labeler of, of a generic drug product can come up with their own um, analytics, their own uh, separate conditions for what is in the solution, what are the paddle speeds, what are the time points. So all the major components of how to analyze for this, um, even with the same drug, even with the same API, can be set differently depending on the generic drug company that's making it. And we've seen, um, even in, in some of our analyses, that uh, certain products, when you test them in physiologically relevant conditions, like uh, acidic stomach and then a relatively neutral intestinal conditions, um, don't dissolve as well as, as you think they would. And uh, we did a deeper dive with lamotrigine, uh, anti-epileptic drug, and saw that when you're running these uh, USP tests that are different for every manufacturer, um, you still see some variability, but uh, when looking at physiological conditions, you can uh, often see much larger variability uh, that certainly raises the question of could there be clinical impact. Um, some of the research we've done with uh, Professor Shulman has been really eye-opening. In this case, looking at um, Ritalin, a methylphenidate, and seeing pretty dramatic uh, differences in the dissolution curves of current on-market generics, hours of difference, that when you even analyze uh, according to uh, well-accepted metrics of difference and similarity, um, having uh, pretty dramatic differences uh, between various uh, generic drug products that are on the market. And um, if this exists, surely uh, folks have done studies on it, and uh, th there's actually many studies, especially with narrow therapeutic index drugs like antiepileptics um, or even drugs like warfarin, um, uh, various cardiovascular drugs. And uh, a lot of these uh, retrospective studies have seen significant correlations um, with, uh, with pretty dramatic uh, adverse events, uh, with uh, uh, medical utilization, um, and uh, is, is an area of continued concern. Um, and these are, are retrospective studies where they're not actually analyzing um, the chemistry of each of these products, but seeing these kinds of correlations uh, at the very least um, is, is reason for concern that 
some of the chemistry we're even seeing now um, is affecting at least some portion of, of the folks that are, the patients that are taking these kinds of medications. So into uh, uh, the modern uh, time here, we're, we're seeing a lot more of this concern arise even in the major press, not just about the problems uh, themselves, but how, what are we doing to fix it? Is there anything being done to address these kinds of issues um, perhaps privatized regulations, certifying drug products uh, is all being talked about more and more. Um, it's even uh, come up recently in a, in a big appropriations uh, committee hearing on the FDA's budget. Um, why aren't we batch testing medications? Um, a coming uh, question direct from uh, the subcommittee chairman. And um, this raises uh, a few questions. Uh, if, if we're going to be serious about doing this at a broad enterprise scale, um, what about cost? What about access? Um, you know, we do need low-cost uh, low uh, drug products uh, in the United States. That's a very important component of the generic drug industry, um, and we need to have access. We don't want to cause shortages. So uh, this is really an important component to differentiate uh, independent academic research type testing, which is the vast majority of science. I mean, the vast majority of what you're gonna read about in the New England Journal of Medicine is not GMP, good manufacturing practice analysis, it's research. It's uh, independently derived and reviewed um, scientific research. And to do that in a standardized fa fashion, you can do it with an ISO accreditation, the International Organization for Standardization, um, which is a broad quality management system that allows you to do these kinds of screens where you can have one method for many different products as opposed to GMP, where the real crux of, of the good manufacturing practice or good laboratory practice as it's used from a regulatory function um, is that every formulation has its own testing methodologies to validate it in manufacturing. And there's been a lot of discussion about that um, and, and even talked about that before uh, the U.S. Senate and the Senate Finance Committee a couple of years ago. But of an important component is that this also makes it much, much cheaper. Um, you don't have to do all the paperwork that's required for regulatory purpose, and it's not a formulation-specific test. Um, so definitely possible to do it. Um, even running some of the price uh, you know, matrices around this, um, when looking at reasonable high volume batch sizes, um, bottom line is this is adding perhaps pennies of cost per prescription um, and is, is not something that will upend certainly the generic drug market or the drug market as a whole and, and is an important component to add in. And then, of course, the question of access. If we're doing a lot more on, on the quality, um, or if we're weeding out products, um, are we going to end up with more shortages? Are we not going to have access to these products? And Professor, uh, Professor uh, Shulman uh, and Dr. Teasdale um, did uh, this exact kind of analysis on um, looking at Valsartan, Losartan, Herbsartan that all had uh, huge recalls over a number of years. And turns out that uh, when looking at the CMS data, there was not a significant impact on price or access. The volumes of these drugs in uh, these kinds of generic markets where there's a robust market, um, which is true of most generic drugs, um, the market was able to correct. Access was uh, continuously available uh, in the United States and price was not affected. So really we need the transparency to differentiate and uh, there continues to be differences that are not correlated to price. And this was recent uh, uh, study and, and data that we're doing uh, as well with, uh, with Professor Shulman, uh, looking at products uh, sourced by Valisher, by Stanford, and looking at price and various levels of uh, carcinogenic contaminants. Uh, you can get a very clean, very cheap product, uh, and you could also get a pretty expensive and dirty product. Um, so uh, certainly behooves us to have a differentiation of that quality. Um, and this is uh, excerpts from a paper um, that uh, uh, published with a variety of key opinion leaders, uh, including uh, with Professor Shulman and, and others all over the, the United States, um, to essentially take this kind of data and turn it into a quality score 
uh, as simple as red, yellow, green, or even green, red. And looking at Valsartan data, no significant correlations to price. Uh, wouldn't it be nicer to just uh, go for the green and, uh, and push uh, the industry to, uh, to generate more green? Um, so in the United States now, uh, there's already starting to be quality programs in major healthcare systems. Uh, University of Kentucky has published and, and talked a lot about their program where they're independently testing and screening uh, the injectable drugs going through their hospital systems. Um, there's other uh, healthcare systems that we're working with directly where we're testing proactively certain drug products and even very large health systems that are starting to require this kind of independent testing and certification as part of uh, sourcing uh, uh, contracts and, and has been very effective in, in doing that. Um, just some initial data on, 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 on that's come out of some of these programs and here looking at Valsartan, where we saw a lot of issues in, in 2019. Um, and this is coming from, from our original petition and study on that. And looking back it, it, or looking again here now in 2022, um, we find a lot of improvements, which is great. Um, perhaps some that have, have exited the market and, and many that have entered and uh, seem to have really addressed these kinds of issues, and at least some that uh, appear to have largely ignored it. So really important to have more um, uh, market drivers of quality to push everyone um, to uh, improve quality and, and get to more and more green. And uh, what we've seen you know, really work uh, at very large scale with, with uh, you know, health systems with, with over 10 million patients is when they're able to contract directly with manufacturers, actually requiring this kind of analysis and certification as part of the delivery of these products. So all that is being done up front with the manufacturers in the laboratory and is arriving with the additional uh, quality uh, certifications, um, uh, assuming all the tests are passing. So in the future, and we're already starting to see this uh, being uh, discussed and, and starting to be implemented even with, with large purchasers is a combination of the two using kind of the more uh, one-time um, uh, uh, evaluation of the quality scoring of various suppliers picking an optimal supplier and then ensuring ongoing surveillance and certification um, through that contract, ideally longer term contracts that also add more stability and consistency uh, to what the patients are receiving. And that's really the overall bottom line of all of this. This, this is not to say that we shouldn't be using generics, uh, for sure not. Um, and most of the products that we analyze are, are of high quality and, and pass uh, all the metrics that, that we're looking at. And uh, I know it's been a big focus of even the FDA in the last few months. And this is a slide um, where uh, they're talking about their quality management maturity ratings, also trying to rate um, at least the facilities in, the, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a fashion that gives transparency. So all these kinds of programs, whether it's more testing internally, externally, um, leveraging these components in contracts, uh, leveraging data and quality scores are all to improve a system that does need to be improved and improve the quality for patients um, to have more confidence uh, in, in this entire system and, and have uh, the best possible outcomes. So uh, with that, you know, thank you very much for, for your attention to uh, the details of this presentation. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. David, thank you so much for that presentation. I remember it was about two years ago, and I think you referenced the article, uh, Dr. Schulman's uh, article he sent out to us to, to share our communications, and I read it. And I, and I always wonder, I always assumed generic medications are just tested and regulated, and there's a standardization. I could not believe, and I bet a lot of people listening here today are in that same boat that there actually is no oversight and that exactly so my understanding is to clarify valid short isn't a pharmacy they're an independent laboratory that wants to vet manufacturers and i was also surprised to learn 80 percent of our generics are overseas china india as you mentioned in the earlier slides so the goal that, that's all correct so the goal 
Wh where do you see uh, this? I guess the big question is, I know uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this, Dr. Shulman, who connected us with you, is actually right as we speak, talking to the White House. You're talking to the White House soon. Where is this going? How, how does this change? It's going to need uh, some sort of governmental regulation, because I imagine manufacturers don't want to uh, just volunteer to get their uh, medications, uh, their drugs checked by a company like Valishore. Where do you see this going? So I think there's there's very complementary private and government approaches here. And what we're already seeing is on the private side, um, you know, more engagement from the purchasers, also some drug companies. We, we've had proactive engagements with, uh, with certain generic drug companies and certain pro uh, products um, that they were very concerned about. They were concerned about the market and, and wanting to show a differentiation where most purchasers are only looking at price. So I think there are uh, private angles for that, um, and and uh, it can be extremely effective when the purchasers are engaged. You know, as we saw, and I was showing when, when a purchaser is uh, leveraging quality components as part of their contracting practices, um, that's a, a very powerful tool to start to incorporate this. And um, you know, you see this in many other elements. You know, there, there's no regulation that requires food to be organic. Um, or even required seat belts in cars before there was a big, uh, you know, outside push to, to get that done. So I, I think there's plenty that that on the private side uh, can push for this. The Milken Institute uh, review had a great uh, piece they they uh, uh, published uh, last year about privatized regulation. Um, and in conjunction with government, could there be incentives? Could there be preferential reimbursements? for health systems or specific drug products um, that are doing these kinds of additional quality programs um, and, and plenty of other you know, elements uh, that could, could this eventually be required just like electronics are required. Um, I think that would be great, but we don't need to wait you know, for government to solve these problems. And I think a lot of the reasons that we're where we are today is that everybody said, well, it's the FDA's job, it's the FDA's problem, let them deal with all of it. And, and it's just not a, a realistic approach. I had Angela Rogers ask a question earlier and asked her to um, mention it here. Dr. Rogers, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel like as physicians, we prescribe drugs and we look at the paper that suggested this was positive for our, our patients. So this I found to be a really alarming <laughs> piece of news and just wondering what you would suggest. I think this seems like a no brainer that for cents on the dollar, you know, we would make sure that we're not giving carcinogens to our patients. So just wondering what advice you'd have for us as a, as a physician group, how to advocate for this. Are there open things that we could add our voice to? What, we, what, what do you propose? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, being part of the conversation is, is immensely impactful in of itself. You know, the fact that Dr. Shulman's talking with folks at the White House now. I know they're reaching out more and more to understand from you know, the healthcare world. But I think there's, there's a great chapter in, in Catherine Eben's Bottle of Lies that if you haven't read, I would highly recommend, um, where one of the Cleveland Clinic physicians, Dr. Harry Lever, that, that's been uh, focused on this for, for over a decade, um, uh, uh, describes as the X factor. You know, when trying to manage patient care as doctors, of course, you're, you're looking at so many different elements at the same time. And I think often assuming that, that the drug is extremely consistent, but he calls the drug you know, his X factor and to at least be cognizant of the fact that it could be part of the issue. And you know, a lot of the doctors that we talk to um, see that as important where if, if a patient has seen a problem at a refill or they, they notice that the manufacturers changed on their product, instead of changing their dosage, instead of changing their treatment regimen, could it be worthwhile to at least consider um, that drug that they're getting um, being uh, a factor in their overall care? And I know Dr. Lever often talks about having his patients just change manufacturer, go back to the manufacturer they had before, or just change, go to a different pharmacy, and he's seen improvement uh, in his patients. So not to say that that's obviously um, the end all and be all for everything, of course, but uh, I think it's it's an important element factor to at least take in consideration, be cognizant of, uh, and if you haven't read it, I highly recommend Catherine Eben's book, uh, even looking at, at Dr. Lever's opinion and other doctors and pharmacologists that, that talk about this in, in much greater detail. 
Uh, David, I have a, a question from Dr. Leibowitz here. Do you see any difference in the level of contamination as a function of the country of manufacture? Sounds like mostly China and India are the main manufacturers though. That, that's a, a great question and honestly really hard to answer. Um, I'd say high level, you know, we've found problems with products in the United States and, and uh, others, right? So just because it's a generic drug even doesn't mean it, uh, it's, it's an absolute mark of, of quality. You know, Zantac was a brand too and, and had just as many issues as its generics. Um, but uh, the main issue with addressing that is, uh, again, not just a lack of transparency to the chemical quality, but even uh, the manufacturing. Um, you can't even find country of origin on, on prescription products for the final labeler, let alone the final dosage form manufactured, let alone the manufacturer of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, let alone the chemicals that are used to make the active ingredient, uh, which are, by the way, almost 100% from China. Um, so the lack of, of knowledge of where these products are coming from is, is certainly an area of concern. There, there's national uh, security concerns around that as well uh, that, that I know are being talked about in government and, and specifically at the Department of Defense. Um, but uh, long story short, it's a very difficult question to answer just due to lack of availability of, of the data. What we do know is um, most of it's coming from overseas, right? And, and so just by a numbers game, uh, a lot of the problems are, are, are certainly there. Uh, however, again, um, location is, is certainly not uh, an absolute indicator of quality. I have a, a comment and question from Dr. Sophia Yen. She mentions, I strongly encourage everyone to read Bottle of Lies. And she mentions it's eye-opening. It does not have a positive ending. Uh, and I think you gave us some detail of why right now. Um, she asks, what's the current status of metformin? I thought they only recalled the ER extended release version, but from your presentation, that's an issue even with the non-ER versions? Yeah, fair enough. I mean, um, look, there's also a, a, an important uh, regulatory, I think, uh, um, a legal shortcoming in the United States system where the FDA doesn't even have mandatory recall power. All recalls in the United States are voluntary. You know, it was your voluntary recall. There's no such thing as a mandatory recall in the United States. Uh, most other Western governments do. We've, we've tried to uh, work with Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro to get uh, the Recall Unsafe Drugs Act passed. Uh, but it's really just up to the manufacturers which lots and which batches get recalled. Um, it does seem that the majority of the issues were in extended release uh, of versions where uh, we've also seen some of the highest levels of carcinogenic contamination. But um, we've, we've seen an IR too, including in some of the data that we were looking at uh, post recalls. And uh, certainly a lot of levels of other carcinogens like DMF. So uh, I think a, uh, a, an additional and I hope complementary approach of privatized quality scoring requirements and, and ongoing surveillance um, is going to be important to continue to clean up uh, these, uh, these issues. Uh, another question here, how can we find out if generics sold by suppliers like CVS and Walgreens are truly equivalent to the original chemical for formulas of all meds? Thanks uh, for the excellent and enlightening presentation. Yeah, so very difficult to uh, really have a lot of control on that from certainly the patient, but even the practitioner si uh, side. I mean, you could obviously go to the uh, you know, dispense as written um, for a particular manufacturer, but the uh, pharmacies don't always have it. Um, it, it is an onerous uh, issue. You have folks like Dr. Lever uh, uh, has talked a lot about that, and he goes at great length, and his office goes at great length sometimes to get the particular manufacturer for the particular patient. Um, so I think a lot of the, the, the high level, most immediate change needs to come from the purchasers that are actually making these decisions. And I think a big market shortcoming in general is that the, the consumers, both patients and doctors, um, have very little control over which you know, brand or generic brand you know, is actually being purchased. So the fact that we're seeing so much increased engagement from purchasers and health systems, I think, is, is hopefully at least a, a positive ending to, to this presentation um, that I think we're, we're really making progress on doing something about it, even if there isn't much capability for uh, the patient or the doctor 
Um, but um, I think especially for certain cases, like I said, doctors at least being cognizant of it. And um, if, if they have the time and capability, there, there are ways to try and push for a particular product uh, to be given to a patient. I'm seeing lots of questions here. Do you mind if I go to one more question that was asked about 10 minutes ago, and then I'll no close on a final question. Um, the ask Chris question is from professional background in quality insurance and medical diagnostic and, and therapy and therapeutic device procedures. Thank you for your seminal work. Have you tackled the drug, drug quality assurance and safety, not from an expenses, but from a perspective of saving in comorbidities, premature mortality to patients uh, and burden on the medical system and economy? Of course, the downstream effects. Yeah, and, and I'd say high level is very hard to quantify, um, but uh, totally agree. I think there's a lot of at least uh, high level understanding that this is costing the health system and even the supply chain and pharmacy system a tremendous amount of money, you know, which, which is concerning. Um, uh, certainly pales in comparison to the potential lives affected um, and perhaps even lost due to these problems. Um, but um, group purchasing organizations like Vizient have done analyses on drug shortages, which the majority of which are due to quality problems, and have found that over $350 million of operational costs are spent on dealing with drug shortages annually just in hospitals. And that's about 25% of the pharmacy system in the United States. So are we spending perhaps over a billion dollars just on the operational burden, pharmacist time, supply chain time, uh, finding other suppliers and, and dealing with shortages alone, let alone all the, the, the healthcare um, costs uh, associated with the impacts of shortages and quality problems. So I think in certain areas like narrow therapeutic index um, drugs, we, we might be able to actually better quantify um, you know, when a patient has a seizure that has a cost associated with it, uh, both uh, dollar and uh, health uh, impact cost. So, um, and, and I think this also becomes rational approaches of where to start. I think a big high level concern is, are we trying to boil the ocean? Are we really gonna test every single drug product that comes into the United States, every single batch? It sounds overwhelming, but what we've seen and already see successful is that you pick high impact areas, perhaps it's narrow therapeutic index, perhaps it's high national security risk, uh, depending on the purchaser, depending on the particular risks uh, and factors that we wanna focus on, we can pick certain drugs, certain products that have very high impact to add these kind of quality programs for and, and grow from there. I mean, even CMS has now been given authority to negotiate drug prices starting in 2025, uh, but they're picking 10 drugs. So let's pilot these concepts uh, is already having a very high impact. And I think that needs to continue and uh, looking at the actual costs um, for these various pilots and specific drugs and products, I think is an excellent idea and something that will hopefully be done more of. Before I close, I just want to mention one uh, announcement tonight, at, uh, and I have a closing with a question. Uh, at at 5.30 is our Internal Medicine Residency Program Research Symposium. All our residents are presenting uh, all their research, so please join 5.30 p.m. at Berg Hall. Uh, I want to, um, uh, David, I want to just mention there's been a lot of comments. Thank you for this uh, work you're doing, and uh, people are saying this is terrifying, all these things that I'm so glad you're bringing to light to all our providers. Uh, Ann Clark actually mentioned, she says, thank you so much. As a consumer, I ask, specific, ask for specific product rather than generic. I actually had a question for you to close on. I noticed in your bio, you have, by the way, five children. That's unbelievable. Uh, and I, I imagine when you do this work, you're looking at it through the importance of getting to the right medications, not just to our patients and our friends, but also our family. Um, so this is Absolutely. in a way of personal work. Um, do you, so do you, when you go or for your kids or whatnot, when you're getting medications based on this, if it hasn't been validated through a company like Balashore or it's not a brand name, do you actually ask for the brand name based on all these things you've learned? Yeah, you know, in, in all of our research, we haven't seen dramatic differences when we looked at brand versus generics, to be honest. Uh, it, it, and if you look at statistics, that's very hard to do because you have one brand, you might have a dozen generics. Um, but I'd say that th this the takeaway really shouldn't be that I'm never going to use generics. I think generics are an incredibly important part of our healthcare system, um, and they can and very often are made well, uh, made very well. We, we've seen generics outperform the brand with objective metrics like levels of carcinogens. Um, so I think 
what I do with, with my family and uh, yeah, with, with 10 kids, we go through, uh, sorry, with five kids where the oldest is 10. Um, so we, we got two, four, six, eight, and 10. And um, we, we go through plenty of medications and, and sunscreens and, and all these things. Um, it, it is important to be vigilant. So I do look, what, what data have we seen you know, at Valisher in, in other studies? And it's, it's not easy. You know, certainly it's, it's not easy yet. It takes more time on whoever's, uh, whether it's the patient or the doctor or just the consumer. Um, you know, there's not a simple uh, way to go about it yet, but I hope that will continue to change where, where this kind of certification, it just becomes part of the system. Um, and we'll see more of that. So it's easier, but um, I think it is important to be cognizant of it and vigilant, you know, look at the data and, and certainly in, in some cases, it might be worth that extra mile to uh, to try and find the right uh, or a consistent manufacturer. And and uh, I certainly do that when when looking for my own family. And um, yeah, no, I think really important and full circle when when we look at this, that th these are really issues that affect all of us, and uh, and they're important to delve in further. And and I'll just say I really appreciate the comments. And and uh, folks are are certainly welcome to reach out to me as well. We we. Really appreciate being part of the academic sphere. Um, I'm david.light at valisher.com, very straightforward. Um, and uh, really appreciate everyone's engagement. David, thank you so much for this work and thank you for being with us today. Uh, we hope to maybe invite you back in the future with a whole different change landscape and uh, these medications and over the counter. So thank you everybody for sticking around and have a great rest of the day and week. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye bye. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.